Good morning. It's good to see everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Beth. I am um, I am a leader at Living Well Church, and I often preach this. Sorry, there's so much stuff on this table. It's just like sort this out, David. I'm just gonna get rid of all this. Um, and um, my husband years ago used to go to this church, and I grew up as well, having lots to do with the Ark, going. Um, on youth camps with the Ark. Greg once had the pleasure of taking myself to Penny Gross back in the day. So I've had lots to do with both Ark and Living Well, really. And in fact, I got married right here in this place seven years ago. And quite a few of you might actually remember my wedding. Just look, oh, look, there's some laughter. And I reckon these people, they're laughing not because they remember fondly what dress I wore. I reckon if I asked them what they ate that day, they possibly wouldn't really remember. If I asked them what, yeah, they might not have eaten. Um, if, I, if I asked them what our wedding colours were or what the theme was, or even what Marcus said, I don't know if anyone really could recall that. But I reckon people remember one distinct thing about my wedding day. And that is that it rained. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Let me just clarify that. It didn't just rain. It poured. It was an almighty freak storm. So much so that I walked down the aisle to thunder. So much so that London Road, a shop was hit by lightning and the whole of London Road was closed. So much so the whole of river was underwater and there were pictures of people standing on top of cars. So much so that the whole of the Orkham Valley was shut off because that was underwater. To the point that I remember standing here really clearly after my vows, looking out that window there, and it was as if someone was just chucking buckets of water out the window. And I thought, well, I've married Johnny. It's been good today. I imagine we'll be stuck here afterwards. Genuinely, 100%, that was my thought. I definitely didn't think... I a million years would have a reception. Um, but people who hadn't attended this church, my friends who had travelled from afar, they were a bit blasé about it. And they were kind of like, well, what did you expect? You're getting married in the ark. <laughs> so therefore, today, I kind of feel like I have to kind of pay tribute to the ark. I have to pay homage to it. And so... Lo and behold, I'm going to speak about Noah's Ark. If you want to turn with me, I do believe um, it's in a very effective and efficient way. I'm going to pop up on the screens as well. I'm reading from Genesis, first book in the Bible. Really obvious to find. Um, chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 9. Quite a few of you may know the story of Noah's and the Ark, and I'm just going to read the introductory passage to it. So it says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it. Leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all round. Put a door in the side of the ark and make the lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath and life in it everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away for food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. 
So I'm just going to extract a few very, very simple points from this. My first point, again, as I said, these are simple. God flooded the earth. He flooded the entire earth. And this recent, I had a great chat with David. David, the wise silver fox at the front here, has loads of interesting knowledge about how a global flood actually happened. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I'm just going to point you to David there. But um, I'm not going to dwell too much on that this morning. But what's really interesting is that God had created the earth. In Corinthians, it says that everything on the earth, all things are created through him. So therefore, God has created the earth. Six chapters passed from that point where he created it, where he gave breath to it, he spoke it into motion, and he decides to completely reinvent it. He completely decides to start again. He decides to actually completely blank canvas it. And that is because there is so much evil. And before the verses I read, he said that even every thought of the humans was evil. Every single inclination, every thought of theirs was evil. So therefore, God decides to completely blank canvas it. He decides to completely start again on something he has created. Now, this, is, this isn't unusual for what we see in the Bible. God often decides to do this. In Jeremiah, it describes God as the potter. And so like a potter, he can get a bit of clay and he can mold it and he can go back to it and start and remold it. And we see this happening in the Bible. I'll give you a few other examples. So Jesus says, behold, I am doing a new thing. In Isaiah 43, verse 19, he says, forget the former things. When he's talking to Israel about the fact that they came out of Egypt, that they were saved from that. He says, behold, I'm going to do a completely new thing. In the Old Testament, we see people atoning for their sins, paying for their sins by sacrificing animals. And Jesus comes along, Jesus completely blank canvases that. That's gone. Jesus is in place, and now they don't have to sacrifice animals anymore because Jesus has paid the price for all our sins. Also in the New Testament, we see the rise of the church. Something completely and utterly new and different. And also we know that we are heading for a time where Jesus is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So Jesus, once again, is going to completely blank canvas this heaven, this earth, and start again. This is something God does, because God is God. And you know, God sometimes does that because in the story of Noah, there was evil that went before it. But sometimes it's because there is something better that he has for us. There is an obvious parallel here between the ark and the living well. God created churches. He created our churches, he put them into existence, he he breathed his life into them. And now it's coming a time where he's putting a complete blank canvas on that and remoulding something completely different. He's remoulding one church. And you know what? It might be in your individual lives as well that you are sat here at a time where maybe there's things that have gone on in your life and the Lord's calling you to step out into something completely new and different. And everything you knew before, he's going to blank canvas it. Maybe you've walked into church this morning and you don't know the Lord. You don't have a relationship with him. And actually you're desperate for something new. You're desperate for actually to know that your past can have a complete blank canvas on it. And you can have a life full of purpose and full of hope. And if that's you this morning, I really want to tell you that whatever's gone on in your past, the law can completely turn that around and give you something completely new. And he can give you new life this morning. And I want to look at that a little bit more because if we want to expand in God, like Noah expanded into the promises of God, he had to say goodbye to what was before. He had to say goodbye to the world that he knew, the land that he lived in, the home that he had built, the the people around him. He allowed God to blank canvas that as he stepped onto the boat. And that has some real practical things for us. It means that as we step into this expansion that God has for our churches, we need to allow him to blank canvas what's gone before. 
And that isn't to say that we don't appreciate or we don't love what's gone before, but we've got to allow God to blank canvas it. You know, when Johnny and I got married, we um, were figuring out our first Christmas. Love Christmas. Who here loves Christmas? Yes, good. I'm speaking to the good congregation. If you don't love Christmas, just get out. No, I'm joking. Um, we were figuring out our first Christmas, and he comes with his whole family of traditions and what they do and the breakfast they eat and the dinner they eat and how they open presents and when they go to church and blah, 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 blah. And I come with all of my family traditions and the breakfast we eat and the food that we eat and how we open presents and what presents we have, etc. And we join together and we're trying to figure out how do we do Christmas together. And the first Christmas, we just decided, let's just do all of it. Because we didn't want to let go of what had happened before. We didn't want to let go of, Johnny didn't want to let go of his family traditional Christmas. I didn't want to let go of my family traditional Christmas. And it was, although it was really lovely to cook for like 14 people on Christmas Day so that our whole families could be there, although it was really lovely to sit around and each family member open an individual present one by one, it wasn't the best thing. And actually now, Johnny and I, have gone, let's just blank canvas what's happened before. And let's start up Johnny and Beth Christmas. What's Johnny and Beth Christmas going to look like? And you know what? We have a great, we have a great Christmas day. We love Christmas day. But that's just a little analogy of what we need to do in every aspect of becoming one church. You know, and you're going to be there, maybe we've got Um, Some kids workers sat here this morning. Maybe we've got worship leaders sat here this morning. Maybe we've got youth leaders sat here this morning. Maybe we've got car parking guys sat here this morning. Maybe we've got people who organize events sat here this morning. People who do hospitality. People who serve out there. People who convene the services. The leaders. And the one thing that the story of Noah tells us is that God blank canvases stuff and starts completely over again. It's time to forget the former things appreciate them, be grateful for them, understand that we've loved them, but let's blank canvas them. And you know, the story of Noah actually tells me a little bit more severely some of the things, because the truth is, is that if the people stayed behind, if any of Noah's family didn't want to board that boat, they were going to be swimming around in stale, rotting waters. They were going to be literally swimming around in death. What the Lord had determined would die. And that's quite a strong word. That's quite a strong message. But if we're really, truly going to come together and embrace one church and expand in the promise that God has given us prophetically, we need to know that what's being left behind has been left behind. And we're not to stay swimming around in it. We're to board the boat. And I just, this is a little side note, sorry. Just a tiny little side note on the side here. We've got four amazing people. Marcus, Greg, David and Katie. And Tim, at this moment in time. Sorry, Tim, so I'll include you as five amazing people. (laughs) Tim has missed him out. But God's given them to us to be a bit Noah-like at this moment in time. And we just, I feel, as a church, need to really appreciate them because it must be excessively stressful, (laughs) hard work, and difficult rebuilding something completely new from scratch. And the last thing they want is for people to come along and go, I missed that spot. I wouldn't put that beam in place like that. Or I wouldn't do it like that. That's not how I built a boat last time. They wouldn't want it. And we need to appreciate the difficult level of duty these guys have got as they kind of forget the former things, the stuff that they've loved, but as they come together to create something really new. So how how exactly do we do that? Well, again, the Bible tells us everything. In chapter 6, it tells us two really key things about Noah. It tells us, one, that Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time. 
So as we come together, as we allow God to completely blank canvas what's been before, as we step out and expand to his promises, we need to remain righteous. We need to remain hungry doing what is good. And therefore, as we see things changing, as we see things evolving, we need to not gossip. We need to not spread falsehood. But we need to remain above reproach, hungry and thirsty for righteousness, doing what is good, doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And you know, as I kept preparing for this preach, I had this song, which is, some of you may know it, it's My Soul Sings my soul sings and then it goes on for this one line and it says all I want is to know your heart and keep me here until we're one and you know what the second thing we know about Noah is that he listened to God's instructions because that chapter ends with saying he did everything God commanded And so we remain righteous, but we listen to his instructions. And sometimes that might mean that in our meetings, whether the kids' leaders get together with the kids' leaders, or whether the youth leaders get together with the youth leaders, or whether the worship leaders get together with the worship leaders, or the hospitality team gets together with the hospitality team, or the leaders of these two churches get together, it might mean that they just have to stay there knowing that all they want is the heart of God and stay there until they're one. Because there will be times we're naive to think that there's not going to be any arguments or bumps along the way. There will be times where we disagree. There's be times that we're desperate to do what we've always done. But actually, we've got to listen really carefully to the instructions of the Lord of how to build the boat. And stay there until we're one. Until we're one with God and one with each other. Because that's what God has called us to do. He's called us to be one church. Next point, again, really simple point. Noah and the family boarded the ark. Yeah, they got on it. This this kind of blows my mind a bit when you really seriously think about it. I just want you to imagine for a second the reality of this situation. A huge boat. You've got giraffes going on that boat. Elephants. I seriously, as a member, this is no... No judgment on the leadership team here, but I would be really thinking, is this thing going to float? Yeah? You've got snakes going on that boat. You've got spiders going on that boat. You've got birds going on that boat. It is going to be, some of, sometimes, like in my kids' books, it's portrayed as this beautiful ark with the giraffe sticking his head out the window, the monkey balancing off the top, the dove there poised at the front with the olive you know, branch in its beak. It's so idyllic and picturesque in my children's books. But it's not like that. If anyone's driven by a zoo at night, you get a taster of what Noah's Ark was like. It is noisy. Yeah, it would have been smelly. It would have been scary as the floodwaters came up and you think, I'm stuck on a boat with goodness knows what animals. It would have been hard work as you dished around trying to feed all these animals as well as to feed yourself. And sometimes to expand and set sail into the promises of God, we have to board something which is uncomfortable and where we're just floating. Yeah? And (laughs) this might be a bit crude, and I apologize for this, but look around you a little bit. You might have come into this ark this morning, and you might have thought, this is noisy. This isn't what I'm used to. Maybe you literally thought, I'm surrounded by a bunch of apes. I don't know. I wouldn't have thought that, but maybe you did. Yeah, but, and yet the one thing that Noah's Ark really teaches me is don't judge God's promises based on being on the boat. Yeah, don't judge the promise of God based on the boat because the boat is a floating, temporary place it's not landed we haven't seen the fullness of God we haven't seen the fullness of his promise we haven't seen the next bit it's just the floating place 
So don't look around you right now and think, I'm going to jump overboard because I don't like this. Because this isn't a true reflection of what God's building and is going to be building. And you know, in your lives as well, this isn't just about the ark and living well. You might simply be at a point in your life where you're looking around your life. You can just see water all around. You feel like you're drowning or you feel like you're floating. You can't see where you're going to land next. And you might be thinking, this isn't how I thought it was going to be, Lord. And yet, don't judge God's promise on your life when you're in the floating boat. You know, I myself personally am at a point in my life. I'm there in my life. I'm literally floating on waters and I don't know what's coming next, but I know I'm in the hands of God. And whenever God calls me to speak when I'm in this place in my life, I know there's some of you sat there and you're thinking, yeah, I'm there. I'm in the same place right now. And you need to know, even though you can't see land, that the Lord's hand is on you and he's guiding you, and he knows where he's going to put you down. But you are sailing in his promises, even though it might feel like you're floating. You know, the floods came for 40, the water and the floods and the rain came for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, and the number 40 in the Bible is that, is, is some, you know, um, means like a testing period. We find it when Jesus spends 40 days in the desert. Moses spends 40 days up in Mount Sinai. It's Sinai, Sinai, sorry, slip of the tongue. (laughs) Checking you were listening. Um, And it's this testing period. You know, it's this period where you've got to work out whether you are solely with the Lord. Whether you're saying, Lord, all I want is to know your heart and keep me here until we're one. So what I want to say is speak to those people who are floating right now. And maybe you feel like you're floating in this church situation. Maybe you feel like you're floating in your life situation. But all I say is, you know what? The Lord's just saying, stick with him. He really wants you just to be calling out to him and saying, all I want is to know your heart. And keep me here until we are one. And so the, my last little thing is that um, the boat is hard. It's hard work. And yet this is just a little personal message for the leadership team. And that's that Noah had the job of sending out the birds. He had the job of sending out the birds and waiting until the boats landed to figure out when's the time to unboard. And for you leaders out there and for the leadership team, your job is to send out the birds, to know that you're on the boat, but to be constantly sending out, identifying, probing, looking out for when's the next stage coming. When's the next part coming? And so I'm just going to come to the end part now. And whilst preparing, I've, I felt this part more than the other parts really heavy on my heart. So if you haven't listened to the other parts, if you thought Beth Boxer, or she's heard it before and she's a bit rubbish and you zoned out, please just tune into this part, okay? I'm not saying the other parts weren't good. I thought they were. Uh, But this is the part I really want you to listen to because, you know, I can talk a lot about one church, the Ark and Living Well. I can talk a lot about our individual lives, but we would be really naive to think that what God's doing is just about this. We would be really naive to think what God's doing is just about us. Because Noah's ark wasn't really about Noah. It was about how God completely blank canvas and completely altered the landscape of what he had created. God is a landscaping changing God. And you know, right now, as I look around 
and I listen to the news and I see the 31st of October brewing and I hear about what our country's going through or not going through or the confusion that is so rife amongst us in every aspect of our society, not just in politics, but where we are financially, in terms of gender debate, all of that mixing together, I realize that the Lord is doing something. And you know, strategically, Dover is exceptionally strategic for this country. You know, Banksy, a world-renowned artist, even knew that. He did, didn't he? He was like, where shall I put a really polemic painting of the EU in Dover? The world knows that we, our little town, is somehow really important in what's coming next. And my fear is, do we as a church know that what's coming next, we are exceptionally important? Because we heard a prophecy where the Lord was saying to us that he's going to open up the floodgates and send torrents again. And we as a church need to be ready for that. We need to be ready for the fact that Dover is a gateway to Europe and is going to be exceptionally strategic in what's coming next. And so, you know, just like in Noah's Ark, where God changed the literal landscape of the entire world, I really, truly believe that God is saying he's going to come to Dover and change the literal landscape of Dover. And are we as a church ready for that? You know, and that's a really poignant question I want you to think about this morning. Because the truth is, is that it's not about whether you feel comfortable about boarding this boat or not. It's not about how much you want to sail around in a church. It's about whether you truly believe that God can use this place to alter the landscape and the environment that's around us. And if you have a passion for that, then it's about remaining righteous amongst it all and listening to God's instructions and crying out with every ounce of your being, Lord, all I want is to know your heart and keep me here until we are one. You know, on my wedding day, when it flooded, I didn't think I would get to a reception And um, Trevor and Lois drove me, and it was an interesting drive. (laughs) And we got to the wedding venue. That was my big surprise, number one. But you know what? As I entered that venue, there was the church. There were people sat here today pushing out the cars from the mud. There were people in that venue whose shirts were soaked through. And they were the young people. Their shirts were young, like soaked through where they were delivering the food from one tent to the big marquee. There were people who had taken off their jackets, their suit jackets, to mop up the dance floor. And you know what? That picture is a little bit of a prophetic picture of what's to come. Because as God opens the floodgates over Dover, as he sends the torrents, the church is just to muck in however way you can. And maybe you've got to take off that nice jacket that you once always loved. Maybe you've got to do a job that you've never done before and push a car out. Maybe you think it's beneath you, but you've just got to get drenched and serve food from one place to another place. But in the rains and in the torrents and in the floods, the church can sail into God's promises. So I'm going to invite the band up, if that's okay, the worship team. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what's on your mind, what's on your thoughts. But I'm just going to invite everyone to stand. And um, 
I'm just going to pray over us whilst the band plays quietly in the background. That's okay, Peter. Um, and if you're willing for this, I just really want you to be receptive to the Spirit. Just put your hands out like this. There's nothing weird. If you're not open for what I want to say, that's fine. That's okay. Just stand. That's not a problem. But if you're willing for God to completely blank canvas where you are right now, I just want you to open up your hands. And that's actually saying, Lord, whatever's gone before, I'm happy for you to just flood that. And I'm happy to just move on and sail into the promises you have for me. And that may be you as an individual. That might be you in terms of your ministry in church. That may be you in terms of becoming one church. But if you want to accept that the Lord can completely potter and remold your life, just hold your hands whilst I pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we so love you. And Lord, your ways are so much higher than our ways. And sometimes when you bring a flood, Lord, all we can focus on is, is what's getting wet. And we can't focus on where we're meant to be going or what we're meant to be doing with you. But Lord, I know you're calling for a time where you blank canvas. You blank canvas people's lives individually. You blank canvas people's ministries. You blank canvas the climate and the environment around us. And Lord, we just pray that as you come and you put a canvas over it all, Lord, we are just so willing to give up, to completely surrender. Surrender what's been important to us in the past. Surrender what we set our identity on. Surrender what we've harbored up and locked in our hearts. And Lord, we just cry out before you, Lord. We cry out, Lord, that we stay here, that our hearts want to be with you, that all we want is to know your heart and to make us one with you and one another, Lord. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that as, the, as we stand here united, as we stand here open, that you come and you begin to download your instructions to us. As you downloaded instructions to Noah, Come and download instructions to us, Lord Jesus, in your mighty and holy, in your powerful and in your loving name. Amen. You know, we're going to continue to sing now, but I'm going to be up the front and some prayer team are going to be up the front. And if you feel that you've got a word or if you want to come for individual prayer for where you are in life, if you're hungry to be one with God or you're hungry to hear individual instruction in your life, then I urge you just to come forward for some prayer. Thank you.